Hello, everybody. Welcome to the panel of the category Mobility. This session will focus on the value of transport strategies to achieve efficiencies in transport and sustainability in cities. The discussion will be held on future mobility plans and on how social and environmental factors impact decisions when planning a mobility solution. One of the overriding themes of this session is electric mobility. I want to present an official who will be moderating the panel. Um, as a team member of Unternehmertum in Munich, one of Europe's leading centers for entrepreneurship and innovation, Anna and her team support technology talent and startups to take the first steps in the German market and an ecosystem abroad. She studied healthcare management and economics and draws from her experience in teaching and moderating, as well as project management, focusing on healthy work environments and international cooperation. Welcome, Anna. Hello, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, yeah, and thank you also for introducing the topic we are focusing on now. I would like to start with a growth quote from Elon Musk. In order to have clean air in cities, you have to go electric. And I think you already mentioned it, um, Juan, it's all about mobility now and also about um, e-mobility solutions and um, yeah, decisions when designing mobility solutions. Um, yeah, my name is Anna. I'm part of Unternehmertum. It's known as um, one of leading um, centers for entrepreneurship and innovation in Europe. I am not alone here today from Unternehmertum, but I will come to this in a second. Um, please allow me now to welcome our panelists. Um, there are three excellent guests, starting with my colleague Simon Herzog. He is senior project leader at Unternehmertum. Second, it's da David Garçon, Managing Director at CAPTA SAS, providing training, consulting, and human resource management services to automotive distribution networks. And our third guest, Luis Carlos Parra, he's a consultant at Hinicio, a strategy consulting firm focused on sustainable energy and transport, and he's alumni of DAAD, the German Academic Exchange Service. Welcome, you three. So each of our guests will have now a 15 minute slot to talk about one specific topic. There will be time for your questions after each session. So please write your questions in the chat next to the live stream window. And I will definitely try to address as much as possible questions to the experts after the sessions. After the three deep dives, there will be also another 20 minutes Q&A session with all of the AT experts. And yeah, now I would like to invite you to elaborate a bit more on how to shape future cities with e-mobility. First to speak is Simon from Unternehmertum. He holds a degree in industrial engineering, was a lecturer for sustainable mobility and a researcher for energy system analysis at the Technical University of Munich including a stay at Unicam Sao Paulo in Brazil. In his presentation, you can find out now more about the new building in Munich city center and what it's all about. So have fun with Munich Urban Colab, the cradle of solutions for the cities of the future. Simon, the stage is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot, Anna, for the kind introduction. So I would like to start with the first challenge, which is, which is sharing my screen. Uh, just one moment, please. Hopefully you can see now the first slide of my presentation. Yeah, good. Everything Great. is fine, yes. Great, and hopefully also the internet connection is stable. So, so welcome. Um, to the audience uh, from my side, thanks a lot for the invitation to Aura Christina Ortiz, to the ABAPA team. And um, I would like now to um, present you our new building and what we are doing here to uh, promote future uh, cities, um, how we create sustainable solutions for future cities. So the title of my presentation is Munich Urban Colab, the Cradle of Solutions for Future Cities. And on the right side, you can see our new building, which we inaugurated um, on April the 1st this year. So it's a super new building. 
So in general, the building, the Munich Urban Colab, located in the city center, I come back to the exact location later, was realized as a cooperation between the city of Munich and Unternehmertum. As um, um, Anna already told, Unternehmertum is the center for entrepreneurship and and innovation um, of Technical University in Munich and the largest um, of its kind um, in Europe. Um, Unternehmertum has its origin, you can say, um, out of a research work where our um, former CEO Helmut Schönenberger tried to find out what is the difference between the Silicon Valley and the Munich region. So both regions have on the one hand great universities, but only one of these regions has a startup scene. And that was the, the first step um, of Unternehmertum in 2002, where Susanne Klatten, one of the major stakeholders of um, BMW, the head of Technical University of Munich and Helmut Schönenberger um, created together Unternehmertum. And this is how, we, um, how the situation is now. We have two locations, 200 people, and, and full-time equivalent and up to 400 employees in, in our two buildings. So, and I would like to give you now an overview about, about some few um, successful mobility startups, not only in the field of electric mobility, but also, which is a crucial point in the field of autonomous driving and censoring, which is super relevant for sustainable future cities. So first of all, um, Fanride, which is a company um, um, making autonomous driving possible um, with the help of teleoperation of autonomous vehicles. Since computers or robots are not that super intelligent to handle every situation in public um, in the in the public um, um, environment, it's um, very important that you have the ability that a human driver which is not in the vehicle, which is a certain um, way ahead, um, a, a certain distance away, um, has the possibility to take over, for instance, when the cars are unable to detect uh, the lines or the lanes on the road. Um, Blickfeld um, is a company developing LiDAR sensors, which is also a very important technology um, for, ma for making autonomous vehicles um, possible but also for drones, for robots, robots, for industry applications, and so on. Then um, very important in the field of electric mobility is of course um, getting knowledge about um, the conditions um, of batteries. And in a few years ago, the company TWICE was established. Uh, TWICE creates digital twins um, for batteries, which helps to yeah, improve their lifetime and uh, to better understand what happens in batteries. And they are really successful. They um, recently received um, a two-digit million funding uh, by a venture capital fund. And um, after their start in Munich, they recently opened up their first office in Paris. And also when it comes to sustainable electric mobility, we are not only talking about um, road vehicles, also very important is the railway infrastructure and the company Connox, which was supported in a various ways by Unternehmertum, recently became a unicorn. So a $1 billion worth a company and their product is mainly predictive maintenance for railway infrastructure. So they are not that famous for end con consumers since most of the people do not own our uh, own railway infrastructure. But it's, um, I think, a super important topic when it comes to the creation um, of sustainable mobility solutions for future cities. Because of the fact, especially when you travel by rail, you do not need parking lots and it's super space efficient, especially. And last but not least, as one of the prominent examples, Deep Drive. Um, they were supported by Unternehmertum, for instance, via um, uh, visibility um, through conference visits. We organized as the digital hub for them. 
they exhibit and work in our Munich Urban Colab and um, at the future mobility space, and they were supported financially by industrial innovators. Um, for example, uh, the impact or the product, what they want to do, um, or not what they want to do, they already have a working prototype. Um, they focus on a platform for electric vehicles and the customers can build up um, whatever kind of vehicle they have in mind. So maybe a golf buggy, a cleaning vehicle, or a shuttle for any purpose. And they are also contributor at the Avapa Summit here um, at, um, at this online conference. So maybe some interesting figures. We do not only work together with um, startups and with entrepreneurs. We also work with established uh, companies and uh, create for them um, innovative uh, solutions, not only in, in the field of mobility, but also in the field of tech business. Just, um, I do not want to go through the numbers there in detail. And we have a variety of programs, which to sum it up, um, provides almost everything from the first ideation phase over prototyping and um, acceleration, scaling, and the IPO. For that, we also have um, our own venture capital fund in-house at Unternehmertum. So just to give you um, a brief glimpse to our network, um, which is characterized um, on the one hand to by good connections to leading universities in, in the world, we, we are partnering with a number of well-known corporates and also um, unicorns like Connox, Lilium, Celonis and Flixbus are um, part of our environment with somehow an origin at Unternehmertum. So this is um, a graph to show the successful development of Unternehmertum. And as I already mentioned, we were founded in 2002 and reached um, now more than 200 people. Um, and there is no reason to think that this trend will stop in the future. So now I would like to go a little bit closer into the Munich Urban Colab, what we have there, what is the infrastructure. So in general, it's an, an 11,000 square meter building. And what's important also um, that we can um, power the system with an 80 kilowatt um, photovoltaic a rooftop, um, which is um, partly sufficient to charge the electric cars in, in the basement. Um, besides uh, the super interesting fact that we have an 80 kilowatt PV system, there is inside an, an DC lounge, a prototype workshop. So it's not only co-working and event, we have several research labs and um, facilities to produce me mechatronical prototypes, wood prototypes up to the size of a mid-sized truck. Yeah, here you can see we have um, an open architecture providing a number of conference rooms and um, yeah, co-working space to bring everything uh, you need as an entre entrepreneur um, into one building. When I make guided tours through the building, I often say that this is somehow a model of the German economy. So it is not only about software like in the Silicon Valley or only about financing like in the London city, you can find manufacturing, craftsmanship, engineering, financing, management and research in one building. And it just takes minutes um, to visit the people and the design of the building as a whole is created to make a random meetings possible all the time. And the whole presentation should not only say that it is super interesting and super cool. It's also an invitation that um, all the audience and all the other panelists can visit us in the near future when um, you can come to Germany. So happy to host you. So um, that's again the um, um, uh, outward appearance of the building. Um, here you can see uh, where we are. So if you know Munich a little bit better, we are located in between the main railway station and, and the Olympic Park. And, um, and also, um, yeah, um, we are have um, 
we have, um, you, you can say, most of the relevant um, players inside the building or at least nearby. So, for instance, our in initiators um, like City of Munich and BMW, um, the state of Bavaria and, and Germany, we have institutions of the European Union in the building and also a lot of industry partners inside the building or at least nearby. So the mentioned uh, companies here, they are directly located in the building. So um, what's some recent activities in the building we hosted during the International Motor Show in, 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 in Munich, um, Overtech from Estonia. Uh, we hosted companies um, displaying the variety of mobility data of mobility options directly and also um, we think about um, make, bringing charging infrastructure to every underground garage, especially for employees. Um, here, some proud um, entrepreneurs um, visiting us and working at our place. And uh, what we conduct, so on the left side, you can see the charging, a sketch of the charging infrastructure from solar power directly to the vehicles into our building, which is already established. And on the right side, this is the plan for the near future where you can see a public charging um, station, including a mobility hub where you can change um, the mode of transport. So, and um, to conclude, one can think about what is all this good for? So it's um, mainly good for, on the one hand, to make innovation possible, uh, not only in China and the US, but also in Europe and in other regions. So that's why we created this building and this environment, and also to make the climate better. Not only the innovation climate, I'm talking about the real climate. What you can see here on the satellite image is that is Munich from space on a day in, in, in summer. And the green, the, the regions with a lot of vegetation, they are much cooler than um, the regions with, um, with only few vegetation, meaning with a lot of buildings. So here you can see on the left side, the scale. Um, so, and in general, what is the conclusion of this image? Vegetations, vegetation leads to cooler cities. And how can mobility innovations contribute to make cities cooler? Um, yeah, mainly to reduce the number of private cars, um, to, um, to reduce the need for parking spaces. And that's what we, for example, did in the past. We, we moved with uh, offering new mobility solution cars from the Munich city center. And this is not... Um, the single project, we continue in further projects together with the city of Munich and with Technical University of Munich to transform cities from this to that. Uh, this is, for instance, a picture of our partner BMW. And if you come to a city like Paris, they have comparable um, ideas um, to transform future cities from um, an ordinary street in Paris, which looks more or less like this, to almost like something like that. And for the, um, to maintaining um, a high um, a degree of mobility for the people, we need clever mobility solutions to provide both um, vegetation in the cities to make a better urban climate on the one hand and on the other hand to make mobility available everyone and everywhere. And that's what we do also um, in the project M-Cube, um, which um, starts in November or which just started this year and lasting for nine years. And if you want to stay updated with this and other activities, um, you can scan with your mobile phone on the right, the barcode, and then we will keep you posted. So that's pretty much it from my side. And I'm looking forward for questions and discussions and hope to see you in Munich soon. Thank you. 
Thank you, Simon, so much. Um, this was very insightful. Um, what an impressive vision. And I can definitely agree with um, all the topics you mentioned. Um, I'm not there every day, but I'm also part of Unternehmerton ecosystem. And I, yeah, I just remember about our last event, which take, took place in July, just after the opening. And it was wonderful um, working in this event areas, but also working there is um, really fun to meet different people from the city, from companies, but also colleagues from Unternehmertum. Yeah, so let's see what questions the audience comes up with. I will read them out, Simon, and then you have the chance to answer them. So um, the first question is from Maria, and her question is, how did the pandemic affect the start and progress of startups? I think it's a very general question, but perhaps you have some insights. Yeah, yeah, of course, I have an, an answer on that. For instance, you know, we have a divided picture of that, I would say. On the one hand, um, mobility startups um, being active in the field of micromobility, so offering cycling solutions, scooters, and so on, they benefited significantly from from the pandemics and their services became much more attractive in, in that context. Um, and also um, our venture capital fund was invested in a company providing PCR tests. And of course, as you can imagine, this company or the value of this company skyrocketed. But on the other hand, it was on the one hand difficult to use a building like the Munich Urban Colab and also startups offering, for instance, ride pooling solutions. Yeah, ride pooling, especially if you are um, kindly asked to separate yourself from other people, then a ride pooling solution is the last thing you need um, where in, in context of an of an corona crisis or in context of a pandemic pandemic. And on the other hand, when the people um, commute much less than also um, traffic jam almost disappeared during that time and therefore the, the people do not need super efficient and um, effective um, public transport and ride pooling solutions and so on and in general um, public transport had a serious problem but um, only few startups are active in that field yeah hopefully this answered the question of Maria. Thank you. I think, Maria, if there is anything else, you can directly reach out to Simon afterwards um, within the chat function or connect him with him on LinkedIn. There is another question I would like to um, continue with this also from Maria. Um, and there are many concerns regarding the electro autos batteries because of how they are produced. Are mm. there any projects looking for options which do not affect nature? Yeah, so on the one hand, I, I do not have in mind exactly um, a startup working on this topic at Unternehmertum, but we are in close contact with, with, for example, recycling companies. And these recycling companies, they recycle everything except of nuclear waste, so meaning in, including batteries. And on the other hand, um, the Volkswagen Group recently created a big recycling plant, I think close to Braunschweig, if I'm right, where um, batteries from electric cars can mainly uh, transferred from old ones to new ones. So the, that the battery materials, the precious materials are recovered. So in contrast to, um, to fossil fuels, for instance, so which are consumed um, just in, in the time when, when they are burned, you can reuse and reuse uh, batteries over and over again. And some other options arise on the horizon, for instance, that you can also, so in Bolivia, for example, um, um, lithium is gathered from, uh, from, dry, um, from dried seas, from salt lakes. <laughs> And um, it's quite likely that you can also gather lithium as a byproduct from water desalination. So I recently wrote a brief article on that. So 
if um, Maria wants to know details, I can share the article with her, how to gather lithium and other battery materials from desalination. And also about the Volkswagen recycling plant and so on. Okay. Thank you, Simon. Um, there is one question about um, the TUM um, consulting services. I think um, I will answer that afterwards because time is running. One last question, Simon. It's focusing on how um, is your experience with Entrepreneur Project focused on Latin America? Is it possible um, to yeah, set up a joint cooperation? I would say yes, but um, I... I have to say, I have to give, give the, back, uh, the, the word back to you because the, um, the responsible person for international cooperation is, is mainly you. <laughs> and, um, but also, I'm always in, quite, in, in, in close contact with people like Sören Metz from TUM Sao Paulo. And if we want to establish on a specific field of technology or cooperation with Latin America, you can also approach me and we try to find a solution. Yes, thank you, Sam. And so I think uh, this would, um, yeah, this would be a topic for another discussion afterwards. There is definitely opportunity to cooperate with us. Um, I will write um, the email address where you can reach out to us in the chat. And also for the TUM Consulting, this is again also what Simon said. Um, there is a contact person, Sören, um, in Sao Paulo, right? So where you can also reach out to when it comes to consulting services of TUM. Thank you, Simon. Thank you so much for this insight. Um, and next, I would like to ask David Garçon to take the floor. He will address the topic, sustainable electromobility, the human factor behind the system. Something I personally consider to be very exciting and important. With 17 years of international experience in the automotive industry, a lot of contact with hybrid and electric vehicles, he's an expert in this field, but he does not forget the people who make it all possible. A virtual applause for David. Thank you very much, Anna, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. And of course, thank you, Abapa, for the invitation here. So just to check it out, Anna, can you hear me? Can you see the screen? Yes, we can hear you and your slide is good visible. <laughs> Perfect. So exactly, humans behind this whole topic. So I think the introduction was comprehensive enough, so I'm not going to tell you a little bit more about myself, but effectively I have some experience in different projects around the world, a little bit more than 17 years, and I have been working with hybrids and electric vehicles in 2009. So we have gathered some interesting topics here. So let's start with, my, with what you might be interested in. So we have four quick chapters here because of course we have limited time. So the first one specifically, it's a little bit about massification and how to make sure that we have more electric vehicles in the different cities. Then we have a second topic related to the ecosystem around electric mobility. Three is risks and responsibilities. And fourth, just a small summary here. So let's start with this first one related to massifying systems. And I just used this typical example, the chicken and the egg, you know, what comes first? Because this is a typical discussion that you get many times like, okay, but do I need the infrastructure? Do I need the vehicle production? What comes first in the in, in governments in the different cities to make sure that we can implement the systems? And I just say, okay, uh, this is just an example from my side, but this is not the most important part, just to make sure that we can implement the systems. Of course, we always need strat strategy and initiatives. And for strategy and initiatives, of course, we need someone who implements them. And that's people, right? So we need investors, we need politicians, we need a lot of persons to know about what we're talking about first, just to make sure that we can implement this. And just to give you a little bit of insight, we're currently working in a project in Colombia and talking with some of the companies, it's very interesting how the decision makers don't have enough information to really make this transition. So they say, hmm, should we do this or not? 
And of course, if they cannot do their business plans, if they cannot calculate what's going on in the future, it's very challenging and difficult for them to make the decision. So here it's a, one of the main topics that we have seen in different locations around the world. We need to inform people. And it's not only, of course, the people on top, not only politicians, decision makers, investors, but we also need to inform general public because once they are informed, they also want to buy this, right? Now they see the benefits. Now they know it's even maybe better than what we had before. And just going quickly back uh, to the question Maria was asking, yeah, maybe the batteries, you know, there's always that question. So things like that have to be clear for people. Is it good? Is it bad? Uh, what's going on in the future? Because then you're going to be more trustful and you can really say, okay, I want that technology in the future. So you see, there's a human factor behind this, even when we're talking at a very high level and it's still not at the place where we would like it. So that's the first point I would like to say in this very small chapter about massifying the system. So remember, decision makers. Okay, now let's go a little bit more into the electric mobility itself. So there is a huge ecosystem behind this. And you can even start from yeah, raw materials such as mining, lithium we were talking about a minute ago, but it's not only that, for example, to produce the electric machines, you also need magnets many times. And for those, you need rare earths. So you need to go to a different location and be able to get that one. So it's a big opportunity for the different countries to provide these new services, but of course, always education, it's important. And you need to think on the people behind. Are we using um, like really prepared hand labor, not child labor and things like that, for example? Are we making sure that the environment is still uh, good? Yeah, we're not contaminating it with the process, et cetera. And it's a big topic right now because of course, some manufacturers are looking for options where to get this raw material, but cleanly, yeah, safely, et cetera. Then let's go to next step of the process. And of course, I don't have everything here, but I do want to use it to give you a little bit of an overview. Then we have production and within production, we have some new challenges as well. We have a lot of new brands, some of them from China, because of course they have the opportunity to build new products. And here again comes the human factor inside because it doesn't mean they already know how to do all this. They are learning in the process and they are making sure that they are educating as well, not only, of course, in Asian markets, but in, in general, in different locations in the world, the new engineers. They're educating the new generations so they can produce this new type of vehicles and technologies. And Simon, I like very much your presentation where you had the startups and you had the product, for example, or the service underneath, but you have the people on top. Because of course, those are the guys that thought about the ideas that got the investors, et cetera. And we always need those persons working out in order to make sure that we get these new technologies. So we need to think, okay, how can we motivate them? How can we make sure that they have access to the resources, even educational resources in order to be able to do this? And your building is one great example for this. Then, of course, we have all related to tra transport. So once you produce the vehicles, you need to transport them around. And uh, not talking only about cars, right? We can talk about electric buses, trucks, even scooters and things like that. Everything is quite similar, but maybe in different scales. But transport is a big issue now because we need to consider safety as well. We have these batteries and we need to make sure it's clean. We need to make sure nothing is going to happen. There are no risks, for example, in case of fire, et cetera. And then again, what's going on with the people in there? Do the drivers that are taking the cars know about this? And the answer most of the time is unfortunately not. Yeah? So for them, it's just another car. But if something happens, it's like, oh, surprise. It was not exactly the same. I'm not saying they are not safe, right? Because I love them and I'm passionate about them. But you do need to know what's different about them. 
For example, transporting the batteries themselves is a big issue. And now there are a lot of companies that are producing special devices to be able to transport the batteries themselves. So you see some new ideas from people that are aware of the new needs. So we want everyone to be aware of the needs. That's why I'm telling you all these steps of the chain. Then, of course, we get to the countries most of the time where we're selling and the dealer level itself, retail level. So we have these dealers, we have all the sales process where you have to learn also how to do it correctly. And of course, afterwards, you need after sales. You need to make sure that your products are working correctly, that they are still safe for everyone. But have you thought about, okay, what's going on with the technician that's trying to fix them? Does he know about everything? What about the unofficial workshops? Yeah, so we're not talking maybe about the big brands because those are normally well aware. But if I take to the car, maybe to a different workshop, does that technician know how to handle it? Or maybe it's not safe for him. So this is something that we need to be also aware of. And I will tell you something about more, uh, something uh, a little bit more about this in the future. Good. Of course, a big topic now that comes into our mind is operation and charging. Yeah, so if we're talking about public systems or the drivers, and then if we're talking about the normal drivers as such, yeah, the customer customers, they also need to charge the vehicle. So we have the whole charging infrastructure here, and it's a huge thing, right? Because we need to produce the electricity. And good thing that in Colombia, for example, more than 60% is based on water. So it's kind of clean then we have also the charging infrastructure so we need to build that we need to make sure that people know how to charge their vehicles and that everything is working right so you see it's a big chain and everything has to be connected this is of course a cycle because afterwards you need to sell the car and then a new customer buys it etc so we want the cars to be available for a long time. Going back to Maria's question, we want sustainability. So it's not like I used it once and I have to throw it away, but we want to make sure that they work for quite some time. And for that, we also have a big topic here that you were talking about as well, Simon, with one of your uh, entrepreneurs. It was related to data and telematics. Yeah, How is that battery behaving with time? Is it OK, not OK? And how can we make sure that maybe in the future we can still run that battery so we're not using the lithium as such? And we got two final chapters here with this big cycle. And one is related to rescue services, of course. And what does that mean? For example, if you have a crash, yeah, or if the uh, fire rescue services need to go because something is wrong with the car, all of them need to be aware of what's going on. And that's persons working there. Those are human beings that need to know what is different from the normal vehicles. And of course, last but not least, you can see around here on the right hand side, second life. And this is quite interesting because you were also talking about this. It's not only recycling and using lithium again for new batteries, but you know that with batteries, we can also talk about a second and a third life sometimes. That means that the battery might not be useful for cars, but it might be used in a house. So I can just remove it from the car and have it in a nice location in my house or in an industrial application where the power requirements are still enough for that battery to be used in that location. So instead of just using it maybe 10 years in my car or 15 years in my car, then I can use it maybe another 10 years as well in a home or in an industry. So now I'm talking that that battery I produced lasted at least 20 years. And that's a little bit more sustainable because afterwards we can recycle it again and we can use those materials. But what's going on here? Who knows how to recycle this ones? Good point. You hear that they are now producing a new man, a new recycling plant near Braunschweig. Yes, that is correct. But hey, we have been having these cars for quite some time now. Why is it taking so long, right? So it's something that we need to be aware of also for the future. And all this is humans touching. David, good. didn't want to interrupt you. Um, there are two minutes left, okay? Thanks. Okay, good, good. Thank you. So just to keep it 
quickly and short here. These are all the types of employees that are in direct contact with the systems. And we already talked about the value chain. And why is this important? We're going to the last one here and then to the summary, because there are some risks. And what types of risks do we have? With normal cars, we have a low voltage battery, but now we can have really high voltage. So we have the possibility of electric shocks and fires and things like that. Again, it's not an unsafe vehicle. It's just that if we don't know what we're doing, of course it can turn unsafe. We can, we can do dumb things. So we need responsibility. We need the leaders to know what's going on because if something happens, this responsibility goes to the top. And this, the legal representative in the company is the one that needs to make sure that everything is working. If not, he can go maybe even to jail, right? If he's not making everything right. But normally the problem is that that person has no idea about high voltage, okay? So again, the same problem here, human factor. You need training. In Germany, there's a framework, very nice, it's based on a standard. It's, it started in 2010, so already more than 11 years of experience. And this is one of the things that, for example, we try to transfer to the different markets. It's make sure that there is a framework for people, a dedication framework, so they can understand the risks and know what's going on. Good. And then just to finish this one, inform decision makers. That would be a key point private and public, raise awareness about new possible services and products throughout the electric ecosystem, because then we can train new people, we can have new opportunities, new employment opportunities, create awareness of risks and responsibilities for companies and for everyone. And finally, implement this education frameworks and regulations that support employees and also protect the employers. Okay, uh, good. Thank you very much for the notification, Anna. Perfect timing. And last but not least, we're going a little bit back to the past <laughs> because 100 years ago, we were a little bit in the same discussion, electric mobility or not. And I think now it's clear we're going towards this direction. So we need to prepare the persons in order to be able to do it correctly. That's it. Thank you, guys. And now we're up into questions. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much, David. Um, very cool. I'm really into this people topic. Um, but yeah, I would like to give the audience again the word. Um, there are two questions for you. I yeah. would like to start with uh, the question of Simon. The recycling rates in many countries for conventional waste are very low, including countries like Brazil. How mm -hmm. could that be changed in context of batteries? Okay, it's a very challenging topic exactly because I was just talking about even in developed markets, they're still producing now, or now they are implementing the best ways to recycle. And unfortunately, in third world markets, we're always a little bit uh, a step behind, right? So we wait for them to do it and then we get it. So it's, yeah, it's of course a challenge, but then my invitation would be, hey guys, we're talking about new technology. Think a little bit in Asia. They are investing now in going to the future. So let's start thinking about that now. Instead of waiting 10 years for the first like a uh, huge amount of batteries to be there just waiting, we need to start thinking about that now. And I think if the government thinks about that, if investors already know that this is an opportunity and they see examples outside because we are moving towards that direction, for certain we will be able to move a little bit forward towards that. So I know it's uh, not the best answer, but of course, thinking about that, informing people about it is the first step to think on how to achieve it. Okay, thank you. Simon, is your question Yeah, fine? so thanks yeah. a lot. <laughs> question is fine. Then one more question, and I would like to um, keep it short, if possible, uh, from David Alfredo. What is the prospect of electric mobility adoption in Colombia, not only in the public transportation? Okay, so of course you say public transportation, they're motivating quite a bit, but I will tell you, we are always kind of dependent on the manufacturers internationally. 
and all the manufacturers are heading towards that direction. So it's not like Colombia is producing all the cars and they can make the decision to say, oh, we're not going to have electric cars. Sorry, but the manufacturers are outside and they're moving the compacts over there. So it's really on our side to adapt quickly because eventually they will only have products that are offered in this direction. And if we want them, if we want cars, we will have to go there. So I, I would say it's going to happen. Of course, it will take a little bit more because some manufacturers will keep the internal combustion engines for a while, but eventually they will just delete that option and we will get there. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, thanks a again for your uh, input and thanks again for your perspective. Uh, I really like that topic. And now our third expert today. Um, he has an impressive background in electronic and electrical engineering and holds a postgraduate degree in project management. With his experience in the Latin American market, but also in international business development, he has been working on projects related to renewable energy, electric vehicles, both with batteries and fuel cells and more. Welcome Luis Carlos Parra, talking about how did Bogota become the non-Chinese city with the largest electric bus fleet? Thank you, Annie, for the comprehensive uh, introduction. Uh, okay, my name is Luis Carlos Parra, and today I'm going to talk about how did Bogota become the non-Chinese city with the largest electric bus fleet. Uh, okay, uh, I would like to add only my, about my professional experience. I was working in Germany in the electric, I was developing uh, software for the solar industry. After this experience, this, uh, after this amazing experience, I was working in Canada, uh, developing new technologies for electric vehicles based on uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen. And afterwards, uh, I was able to work uh, by Enel, the largest utility company in the world. I was developing uh, actually business and developing the new ways uh, which Colombia are using right now to, to make the new tenders and new products for the electromobile sector. And now uh, I have the pleasure to work by Inicio, this uh, European uh, company. Uh, and in this company, I am consultant. We are working especially in green hydrogen and in electromobility. Let me talk about just 30 seconds about Inicio. Inicio is a, a strategic consultant company. Uh, we are trying to enhance governments, institutions, and companies to use new ways of, of energy, especially the green hydrogen, as I said before. And what is important to, to emphasize here is that we are trying to emphasize our, our strategic consultant, not only in economics or politics, or, or just like the, the conventional analysis that you are uh, watching in news and in, in media, where we are trying to push forward the analysis about social impact of new technologies, uh, the, the social and the, the politician impact that we will have uh, to assume a society to, to make these old technologies uh, available for everyone. So I have divided this presentation in three parts. The third ones, we'll try to answer this question, where does the problem come from? Why Bogota is transforming its uh, fleet, its bus fleet? The second part is why Colombia, why Bogota, what is the context of Bogota? And the third one is the electric bus fleet in Bogota and why we are talking about the largest fleet bus in, in the world outside China. So where does the, the problem come from? As you may know, a different part of the region of, around the world are responsible of most of the, the green uh, house emissions and it's actually uh, one of the, mo uh, the most important problems of humanity. For example, Asia is the largest emitter with the 53% of global emissions. China, especially China, emits about 10 million tons of uh, dioxide carbon per year. Uh, North America, 18%. And regions like Latin America, we are not so responsible for this problem, but actually we are part of the problem for sure. Uh, how much? We are about maybe 32% of this uh, problem, but something that we have to, to, to be clear in this point is that the, the global warming are taking a very specific problems, not only for our environment, but also for the society. And this is the problem that we have to, to uh, solve as soon as possible. So 
if you uh, start thinking about what kind of sector is the responsible of those emissions, we will see in this graphic that the energy is the responsible of the 32, uh, 33, sorry, percent of the total global emissions. In this sector, we can uh, talk about all about transport. Transport, the only the transport, uh, talking about public transport and personal transport, are the responsible of the 62 percent. So, so you you may think, okay, that's too much. That is not too much. Okay, we'll see it later. But something that I would like to highlight at this point is, in order to prevent several climate change, it's necessary to rapidly reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. The world emits more than 30 billion tons of, of those gases. And for sure, this is a problem that in Latin America we have to uh, solve as soon as possible, as, as, as I said before. To achieve production goals, we must know where our emissions come from. And as I said before, transport, that the topic that we are talking about in this moment, is the responsible of 16% of those emissions. So something that we have to, to, to clarify is some sectors of the huge industry are more easy to electrify. For example, you will see in this in this point, let me turn on my highlighter. You will see here that some part of the of our logistics and the global uh, industry are really hard to electrify. For example, as I say, long distance transport is really hard to electrify with batteries, for example because the, the battery, the density, the energy density of the technology that we have available in the industry uh, is not good enough to, to supply the energy that the long distance transport needs right now. Aviation, shipping, and a different kinds of production in iron and the steel industry and cement are a really good uh, uh, problem to solve for engineers and consultants all around the world. You will see right here in the other graphic that aviation, navigation are now completely depend of fossil fuels. When I say molecules, sorry, that's in Spanish, but uh, molecules, it means like fossil fuels, depends 100% of fossil fuels. In other hand, like production of iron and steel are starting to electrify its production process. Agriculture, chemical industry, paper, and food uh, industries are trying to become more sustainable, introducing new technologies as electrification with batteries and with green hydrogen. But the transportation is the problem that we are trying to achieve in, in this particular moment, like Bogota, uh, as I will tell you uh, in, in a few minutes, uh, have, the, have one of the worst environment problems in all Colombia and in fact in all Latin America. And that's why we, we want to, to give a little more context about why Bogota are trying to do that. And for you, when you start thinking about the global market, for years now, energy analysis has been talking about big oil as the spectacular point. And some experts say that we are facing this problem right now. The peak of oil, the moment in which the extraction and consumption of hydrocarbons in the world will reach its maximum level to be to decline trade fire. Replaced by other types of energy resources. In this case, we are talking about electrification, how the electricity and new kind of sources like green hydrogen are trying to replace these fossil fuels and this old kind of energy that we were using uh, later. So it's important to, to take in mind that all kinds of transportation could be electrified. Buses, personal uh, carts, uh, ships, airplanes, and each technology have a, a moment where the cost of parity will be available for uh, certain markets, for sure. It is a, a graphic that is trying to specify the, the global perspective of this total cost of ownership that I will talk about later you know, about this concept. But what is important to say here is that the technology and the economics uh, are giving a insightful signals about that we are ready to electrify the transport systems. So. Bogota nowadays are trying to do that. The first uh, way that we found to do that is using natural gas as a real alternative for saving energy, money, and we found benefits for the environmental. Vehicular natural gas has become an important option in Colombia. 
uh, actually in different cities around the around uh, our city are trying to to use more gas natural gas than for example gasoline or diesel this is the demonstration uh, uh, from different companies in different cities uh, all around Colombia that are the the sales and the reconversion of all cars are trying to to uh, its best to transfer our energy matrix. In particular, in Bogota, the number of conversion reached almost 9,000. Uh, actually, this is a, a old uh, number. It's up to date to maybe 2018. Uh, and it means that the 60% of the corresponding uh, public service are using now natural gas, so such taxis, white uh, trucks, pickups, and 38% of this sector are trying to migrate to do to those new technologies. Uh, other thing that we have to, to place in mind here, and as, as David said before, price of batteries are decreasing every year, and we are uh, having all the perfect conditions to uh, talk about uh, electric um, mobility in the actually in the public sector too. Between 2010 and 2019, the price of lithium ion batteries fell by 88% from 1,000 maybe to 100, almost one tenth of, of its price, of its average price. The introduction of new chemicals, new technologies, new materials are trying to manufacture new technology that are making it possible. And if we talk now, we, we land to Colombia, to Bogota, and, and talk about the context. Nowadays, this uh, an update is a number, the 50% of all the particle matter come from heavy duty transport. It means freight transport and passenger transport. And that's why this is a really problem that we have to solve. Um, different um, pioneers all around the market are trying to do its best. Enel Coenza, the biggest utility company in Colombia, has a pooling network of electric vehicle charging centers for its customers, including a fast charging. The utility company signed an agreement with Terpel. I will show you later. Uh, a map where how this uh, the, the, this infrastructure plan nowadays, and the Coenza also launched a pilot project together with a local enterprise, Carby, and Grupo Exito in Slayak like Supermarket in Colombia to provide an electric vehicle exchange service that is now working. In and you you can go to a, a Exito in a, a market and you can charge your car for free. Empresas Públicas de Medellin is the the biggest utility company in Antioquia region has a network of 92 charging centers, including five fast charging. And that's awesome because Medellin per capita have more infrastructure than Bogota. Celsia is the utility company of Cali, all, all this region in Colombia. And it also has a network of nine charging stations. Empresas de Energía de Pereira is currently working on the creation of an electric corridor for charging electric vehicles. This is not uh, developed as well as we want, but they are doing uh, its best. Uh, BM and different um, uh, companies like BYD, Renault, uh, also we have a porch here. John C. inaugurated the first fast charging station for, for public use in Bogota. It's located in, in one of the biggest market centers in Bogota. It's called Unicentro and it's located in the northern of, of the city. 50, uh, pardon, uh, 7,500 US dollars. Uh, has been invested in this particular uh, charge and is working right now for the public and it offers its energy for free. We are trying to push forward that these technologies in Bogota. Here you can see the, the advance or uh, maybe the, the plan that Bogota has now, the Colombia, sorry, has right now. We are trying to develop those electric roads that we call it like a, a popular language. Uh, it means almost 500,000 uh, kilometers uh, of electric rods, EV stations, maybe 35 stations on rods. And it means that we will have one station every 500 kilometers. And I think it's, it, it will push forward uh, this infrastructure in a really interesting way in Latin America. And why it's happening in Colombia? Nowadays, you see this, this picture, Colombia is the second country with the largest sales of electric vehicles. 
from two main technologies. The first ones, the battery electric vehicle technologies and the hybrid electric vehicle technologies. Uh, Mexico is the only country that uh, overcome the, the sales of, of Colombia, but okay, we are uh, less people here. So per capita, Colombia are selling more electric vehicles than in Mexico. If you see the sales per technology in Bogot in Colombia, sorry, you will see that the regulatory and the context that we were talking the last minutes are push for, are pushing the sales of all technologies. Actually, nowadays in the last years, 2020 and 2021, the hybrid electric vehicles are the technology that are more popular between the people. Uh, the the last fact that I am talking about is due to um, relative incentives that the government are giving to all kinds of technologies. In the past years, 2018, 2017, only the battery electric vehicle was, uh, were, sorry, um, implemented in the regulation. And nowadays, hybrid electric vehicles was added to the regulation to, to accelerate the transition to these technologies. So if you want Alan? to understand, Sorry, yeah. um, perhaps it would be great to come to an end in about one to two minutes as we want to have our common discussion. Thanks. Okay, no problem. Thanks. Okay, so uh, I, I'm going to be uh, really short in this part. TCO is a way where we can evaluate how expensive a technology is, not counting only the initial cost, but also considering cost of operation, maintenance, uh, the downtime uh, price, the cost of production, the remain value, okay. And if you put in a perspective, the traditional technologies, the internal combustion engines vehicles, nowadays are more expensive than electric vehicles. Just because of the, the price of the, ener of the energy are more competitive than in comparison in, with, for example, a diesel or gasoline. And that's why all the, all the customers, the normal customers and the governmental entities are trying to uh, make the transition to this kind of thing of this. This is our principal argument to, to make this transition. And of course, there are barriers that we have to achieve. Improved charging infrastructure for sure is one of them. Uh, the type of technology to promote electrification and the national level, the standardization of all those technologies have to be achieved in our country. Absence of regulation required for sure operation for the fleet and Richard Price uncertainty are trying to, to be solved for, dif for different utilities all around Colombia. And okay, this is the, the one of the last um, slides. I want to uh, show you our fleet, our bus fleet. Uh, we have almost five, uh, 1,500 electric buses all around Bogota. They are uh, giving services nowadays to the customers. Okay, not all of them. They are planning to, to be working for this year, but the COVID-19 crisis takes some problems to, to implement this plan in Bogota. But what is important to, to, to attend here is that through five different tenders, it was possible to consolidate the entry of these zero emissions vehicles. Only last uh, of them, I mean like uh, 595 uh, were new and they are made from a uh, new technology like the battery electric vehicles. Bogota has overtaken Santiago, Chile, We has 776 electric buses. A trend that is gradually spraying through the area. And for example, the cities of Medellin and Cali have 65 and 35 electric buses uh, respectively. The city will invest uh, almost 500 million euros to change the acquisition in addition to another uh, kind of, of investment in this sector. And also the manufacturer that will deliver buses in China, in, in Chinese, sorry, BYD, he was in, uh, conclude that it will only deliver the chassis and power trains. It means that the buses will be finished in Colombia. So new, new jobs will be created for this industry and it will be manufactured by, by Buscar, the, a Colombian company. And the Coenza, the utility of the city, participate in this tender to its company, Bogota Zero Emissions, this company, 51% private, will build two charging points, Fontion and Uzme, that is being a functionality in, in this moment. So the comprehension of, for the provision of this service covered 15 years on December 26, uh, uh, 2020, 100 new electric buses entered in the system and joined the 30 that we were already running in it. This year will grow progressively during 2021 to reach the announced five uh, 1500 
to achieve our tax. The last message, regulatory signals, our government support is key to manufacturing technology and advancing products. So thank you so much for, for your attention. Thank you, Luis Carlo. This was so much um, insights, very insightful, very um, much information. Um, thank you for this kind presentation. It would be great to stop sharing your screen again. Um, I would like okay. to ask every of the experts on stage now again, I would like to continue the conversation about electric transportation together with all of you. And I think there is one more question in the chat I would I like to start with because I think it fits really also to the last presentation. Are we going to have a standard battery for electric vehicles? Perhaps Luis Carlos, you showed the slide 21st with these different kinds of vehicles. Do you, would you like to give an answer on that? For sure, let me let me try to share again. The sales you say, right? 25? 21st, I guess, was with this. It, it was, I think, I think you are talking about this one. Okay. So what's the question about this slide, sorry? No, the question was, are we going to have a standard battery for electric vehicles? What do you think? Oh, uh, okay. Maybe the standardization of the batteries are not so important. What, what really means here is what kind of connector we will have in our infrastructure. Uh, countries like Germany are facing problems in what kind of connector should I use when I come to a, a charging station? And to ensure that we will have like a, a easy curve of knowledge as fast as possible, we have to standardize more than the batteries, the type of connector that we are using. I need to, to be clear in this point uh, is the, the, on, the only technology that use energy from the grid is the battery electric vehicles. The hybrid electric vehicles don't, don't use uh, electricity from the grid, but the plug-in uh, hybrid electric vehicles does uh, use the, the, the energy from the grid, but not in the same amount of the battery. So if we really want to, to standardize the market, we have to emphasize in the battery electric vehicles and it's, types of, of charge, uh, charge uh, uh, models. Okay, thank you so much. Um, my next question um, would be about our political framework. Um, David, what do you think, which political framework do we need to get closer to a sustainable electric transport system in the future? And I guess you might imagine where I'm heading, <laughs> but for me, an um, education is something that needs to be inside. And I have participated in a lot of meetings and it's very common to see they're always talking about, yeah, the infrastructure and they're talking about technologies and we're talking about, yeah, how to motivate uh, customers to buy them. Uh, but education is always a little bit like lagging behind, you know? So I think it has to be on par with the other initiatives just to make sure that the different persons in the roles know what they expect, not what know what to do. And they are aware of, as I was saying, all the risk responsibilities, but that we can prepare also for new employment opportunities. So just summarizing, an education firm rate, framework needs to be inside that political framework in order to make sure that everything is moving at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Again, a people topic, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Simon, would you like to add something or, I don't know, with your background, do you see any differences between German and Latin America? Yeah. I would say that on the one hand, the education and innovation sector can be improved. So I made, for instance, for some projects, international statistics on where the um, innovations, the startup um, foundations come from. And um, if you take absolute values or relative values, meaning uh, startups per 1 million inhabitants, then um, one has to say that Latin America is still a bit under the average. And that should be improved on the one hand. And also I think, um, biofuels like they are applied on a large scale in, in Brazil might be of biological origin, but they cannot be considered as sustainable fuels since significant areas 
um, of land where in former times was rainforest um, are converted into sugar cane acreages. Okay. But Thank in general, I would say from a meteorological point of view, in most of the Latin American countries, the uh, conditions for electric vehicles are better because the conditions for wind and sun are better than in Germany. Okay, cool. Thank you. Perhaps something to add. Um, do you think there are two or three specific next steps needed in the field of electric mobility? so that we can be as green, efficient, and as individual mobile in the future. So Concrete. from my side? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so on the one uh, hand, I would say what would make international competition easier and more fair would be the introduction of a global CO2 price. That would be a very fair solution, not to create um, a number of different subsidies, but but it would just foster the introduction of electric vehicles if um, fossil fuels are priced and also electric power coming from fossil, fi fossil fired power stations. And on the other hand, as I said, um, research and education has to be improved that uh, the countries can create solutions by their own and not only Far East countries provide the solutions or the whole world is uh, um, governed by Tesla. And also the grid infrastructure, of course, has to be improved since with um, millions of electric vehicles, a significant grid load uh, comes up from the vehicle side. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Luis Carlos, my next question I would like to address again to you. Um, Simon said before there was a project about, it was called reparking in Munich. Um, have you also reflected about possible sociological strategies that could be used to reduce the vision of individual transportation as a status symbol in order to increase the use of public transportation? Okay, this is a, a social phenomenon that we are facing right now due to COVID crisis. crisis. Um, nowadays, uh, for example, our, our local uh, public transport system, Trust Millennium, are facing that problem. Uh, but with the, with the correct public uh, incentive, the people are going to use more public transport. Uh, we, we don't have this problem like in Germany that most people have uh, personal uh, cards. But what we have is uh, a really difference between rich people and poor people. And the, that difference is really huge in our society. And we have to be clear that our, a society that is really fair with its uh, persons, with the people, have to prioritize the public transportation. Not only the rich people, sorry, the poor people have to use the public transportation, but also the rich people. In this way, we will have this, uh, if, if we reach that point, We'll be sure that uh, the, the transport will be more fair for everyone. Will be open for everyone. We have to, to defeat this barrier in our society. Cool. Thank you. And um, yeah, David, also to stick to this answer, what do you think or how do you think new developments in electric vehicle technology will affect our urban mobility behavior in 10 years' time? Okay, so I think the multi-transport mode is a big topic right now. So most of the time people are thinking on the cars, right? Uh, but electric mobility also opens the way to other things. Have you have seen the scooters that we have right now, bicycles, etc. So I think that is going to become more and more common in all the cities. And we're going to have also more technologies, applications that can put everything together. So people can easily say, I want to go from point A to point B. And then you will just use a different mix of systems that will take you there efficiently and cleanly. Uh, so that is the vision uh, that I have, of course, that will take place in the future. Okay, thank you. Perhaps something to add about our remote work. I don't know if you're sitting at home at the moment, but it looks like that Simon are sitting at home. It's also me. Um, but yeah, we're on the weekend, so perhaps um, for sure. But how can remote work transform our behavior about transportation or the use of transportation? 
of course, that's a big topic as well because it's demonstrated now that uh, you can work remotely, right? Many companies were not aware really of that, did not like to try it before. Now they uh, are trying it and it works, but it's all, there's also a human side behind. There are people that definitely don't feel comfortable. They need to share, they need this experience, you know? And also when you're trying to develop new ideas, brainstorm, you need certain community. Uh, so it's, I think, going to be a little bit of a mix. We're not going to have full remote locations now, uh, as some might think. I, my idea, it's more a little bit of a mix. So sometimes you're going to be working remotely, but you definitely have to mingle back at the office sometimes to get some ideas running. And there is where you can use, of course, your green mobility. So not a lot of cars for people maybe in the future, you know, because it's not needed every day, but more this public friendly transfer means. Mm -hmm. Simon, I have a question for you. Um, it's about Munich. I can, I feel like that a lot of people are also aware of moving out of the city. Um, how do you feel about remote working, coming back to the office? Is it necessary in the future to have an own car still? Or what, what about our behavior when we move out there, outside the city? I think if we are talking about today, then especially if you live on the countryside, it's really hard um, to have the same standard of living without our own car. But if you think about maybe uh, on the year 2030, uh, for instance, Volkswagen and other companies, they want to introduce until then fully autonomous shuttles, which can bring you, for instance, to the next regional train stations. And um, with the help of that, um, I think you can have almost the same level of mobility in a rural area like you have in um, dense urban populated regions. So um, these technologies, they can bring an affordable public transport to almost every village. But um, from the position of today, this is, I would say, not possible. Uh, not possible. It's possible, but not at the same standard of living. Okay, thank you so much. Um, yeah, perhaps last question for you, Louis. Um, how do you feel about the key drivers of the adoption of electric mobility in your country? What are the key drivers in one sentence? Infrastructure, for sure. People understanding, education, as David said before. And a lot for the environment, I would say. Okay. You have to educate people not for technology, but also for the environment and the implication for our future and the future of the next generation. Wonderful. I think that summarizes it all very well. What we talked about, the human factor, but also the technologies, the environment. Thank you so much. Um, we're already coming to an end. Um, to all of you dialing in from home again and um, take the advantage of this wonderful online platform and get in touch with the speakers or write your questions in the chat. Perhaps Louis, David and Simon can answer them directly or afterwards on LinkedIn via email. Um, thank you to all of you experts joining this very inspiring session about mobility. And it was wonderful to listen to your input sessions to meet you here at the Avapa Summit. It was a great organized, a well-organized event, I, I would say. And yeah, I can think I think we can all be very excited about how mobility in Latin America, but also around the world, will develop and be more sustainable in the future. So to all of you, to all of the guests, to all of the experts, um, enjoy the rest of the event and goodbye. Oh, thanks Bye. a lot. Thank you. Thanks to you Bye. for the great moderation. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thanks. And thanks to my colleagues here. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Luis. One. Bye. Thank, thank you, you all. It's really great. Thanks for the great moderation. Thank you.